Good afternoon. Welcome to everybody joining our webinar. I'm sure we'll have some more people logging on here shortly, but we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Greg McRae, and I'm the founder and CEO of Foundation Group. We're based in Nashville, Tennessee, and we have been around since 1995, and we provide compliance and formation services for nonprofit organizations all across the country. And we welcome you uh, to the webinar today, successfully starting a new nonprofit. And our topic is going to be how to avoid the pitfalls in that process and maximize the impact that you can have. We'd like to start all of these uh, with a poll. Uh, before we do that, I do want to bring to your attention a handout that's on your dashboard there. And it's a PDF called Successfully Starting a New Nonprofit. It's an ebook that we put together uh, some months ago that we think will be very helpful to you. So feel free to take advantage of that. Starting off with our poll question, though, for this session. How many of you in the past have served as a board member or worked as an employee or key volunteer in a nonprofit organization? We always like to know the makeup of our listeners, and I believe the guys are launching the poll here. So go ahead and vote on that, and then we'll check out the results here in just a second. So I'll be quiet while you guys, uh, while you all vote on the poll. All right, we got answers coming in. Go ahead and give it here. About another uh, about another 10 or 12 seconds, guys. All right, let's go ahead and close it out. All right, fantastic. Well, this is a typical result that we would usually see, a pretty good mix of those who have and those who haven't. And hopefully this information will prove useful for all that are participating today. One of the things that is absolutely the truth, and that is we now live in a world that really fully embraces nonprofit solutions. I think everybody kind of accepts the idea that government can't solve all problems. What is interesting is that with every passing year, nonprofits are increasingly being looked to to fill that gap. And one of the things that's very interesting about the situation with nonprofits, and this is especially true as we talk to clients that we're working with, Nonprofits are really becoming the creative platform for problem solving innovation. It's absolutely amazing. Every week we hear just such interesting and such innovative ideas presented to us by prospective clients, problems that they see in the world and solutions that they envision for meeting those needs. And this is a huge change from 10 and maybe even five years ago. It's not unusual that people are wanting to start nonprofits to solve a need that goes back or as long as anybody can uh, can dare to try to go back. What is interesting, though, is the degree to which people are trying to put this as a first line of attack on problem solving. One of the areas that you, that you see that most profoundly is with college grads. In the time that around the time that we started this business, it wouldn't be typical that you would see college graduates starting college with the idea of coming out and working for a nonprofit or even starting a nonprofit. Now that's extremely common. So let's see how that this translates into numbers. Well, as of December 31, 2016, there were 1.2 million charities and private foundations operating in the United States. Now what's interesting about this is that doesn't even take into account the number of nonprofits that are not charitable in nature, but providing some type of non-commercial purpose. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. So just in the area of 501c3s, we're talking about 1.2 million charities as of about a year and a half ago. These are the most recent numbers that we have from the Commerce Department, but as of the end of 2014, we're talking about nonprofits contributing nearly $1 trillion to the U.S. economy. Now, as most of you know, right now we're kind of in a boom economy with a with a GDP of around 5%, so just a lot of economic growth going on right now. You can imagine if 937 billion was true in 2014, that number would even be substantially higher today. Another fascinating statistic is that 12% of the US workforce now are employed by a nonprofit organization. That is an amazing increase over just a few years ago. Just last year in 2017, almost, well, slightly over 100,000 nonprofits got the process started 
for starting a 501c3. Now, maybe not all finished, maybe not all got through the process with the IRS, but over 100,000 began the process. That's just a staggering figure. Another interesting statistic is that fully 25% of Americans age 16 or over at least will tell a pollster that they volunteer through a nonprofit organization somewhere in the US. As with statistics, as you can imagine, those numbers don't always tell the whole story. There's also kind of a negative side on the statistical frame. Let's start with this. Unfortunately, the average nonprofit started in America has a less than 50% chance of surviving to its fifth year. Now, that sounds like pretty good odds, actually. I mean, if you know any, any statistics about the for-profit world, you know that 90% of new, new businesses fail within the first three years. So a 50% survival rate to the fifth year actually sounds like it's beating the startup odds. But in reality, the attrition for nonprofits is much worse than this graph makes it look like. When a for-profit fails, you kind of know it. The restaurant closes, whatever it is that was the venture that you knew, suddenly the lights are off and the door's locked and there's a for lease sign on the door. When a nonprofit fails, often it's not quite as visible. And sometimes the founders or the organizers don't officially shut it down as far as filing the paperwork that's required to completely wind it up. What we see happens a lot of times is that a failed nonprofit turns into a zombie organization that is technically uh, still alive, but functionally dead. The Taxpayer Advocates Office, another interesting statistic here, the Taxpayer Advocates Office, this is an office within the IRS. And the TAS is not the IRS itself. It's actually an office within the IRS that advocates for taxpayers, sort of an intermediary between the taxpayer and Uncle Sam. Well, they did a spot study a couple of years ago where they took a, took a look at a thousand organizations that were registered with the IRS to see if they were even legally formed correctly. And what they found was shocking. They found that 400 plus of the 1,000 organizations they reviewed weren't even properly incorporated. So as you can imagine, this has the potential to blow up on those organizations down the road. Well, May 2011, there's a date that kind of lives in, in infamy for those of us that work with 501c3 organizations. I, I won't forget this day very easily because I was leaving that day for a three-day family camping weekend. And we knew that the IRS was going to soon drop their initial list of organizations that they were revoking their 501c3 status, but they dropped it that day without, uh, without announcing beforehand that was the day it was going to happen. So I got a call from my office saying, hey, you need to come in. The IRS just dropped that list. Well, in one fail swoop, the IRS revoked the 501c3 status for one out of six nonprofits in the U.S., and the reason they lost their status was failure to file their IRS Form 990. That's a like a tax return for nonprofits, and that's filed on an annual basis. Failure to file for three consecutive years will result in an automatic revocation of your 501c3 status. Well, this was the first time since that rule change that three years had elapsed. So this was the initial list. Now, the IRS revokes additional organizations every month since May 2011. It's nowhere near the 100,000 number. It's just a, a, an accumulative add-on to that original list, but that was a shocking day to have one out of six organizations lose their status. So let's talk about some good stuff. How do we put the odds on your side and for you to have the desire, have the impact that you desire to have? How do you get to be the person you see in the picture there with arms raised in triumph and not part of the negative statistics? Well, our good friend, Sir Francis Bacon, back a long, long time ago said knowledge is power. I said pretty recently that working with the right people helps a lot too. So with this webinar, we want to address the mechanics of starting a nonprofit, but we also wanna talk about best practices that are necessary for your success. And finally, we're gonna wrap it up by exploring how Foundation Group can help you make that happen. So what does it mean to be a nonprofit? You know, we can call this an overview, or we could call this what's so different about a nonprofit. But before we do that, I wanna look really quickly at where nonprofits and for-profits are a lot alike. 
a nonprofit has similarities to a for-profit company in a number of areas. And the first of that is structure. All business entities have to have some type of formal legal structure of some kind. And that could be a corporation, a partnership, uh, maybe an LLC or a sole proprietorship. Another area is governance. All nonprofit entities have somebody or somebodies who are responsible to govern the organization. I mean, the buck's got to stop with someone. So someone is in governance of that organization. Another point of similarity, maybe a paid staff. This one's not required, but it's possible. I think it's kind of obvious everybody considers for-profits to have employees. Well, nonprofits can have paid employees as well. Another area of similarity is that they may both offer products or services uh, even for sale. All business entities are offering something to somebody, even if it's a free charitable activity out of a nonprofit. Really, if you think about it, it's still a service. And nonprofits can sell products and services. This is something that I think a lot of people misunderstand is they think that nonprofits are all about giving. And that's often true, but nonprofits are also able to sell products and services as long as those products and services are related to their exempt purpose. Another point of similarity is that nonprofits and for-profits are both regulated by state and federal law. I don't think there's a big surprise to you there. All business entities are subject to some type of rules or regulations that govern their operations. And finally, a nonprofit organization and a for-profit organization must account for its finances. All business entities have got to account for income and expenses and report such to the state and to the IRS, usually on an annual basis. So those are some of the similarities. Let's talk about, for the remainder of our time together, what is truly different about a nonprofit. And nonprofits are significantly different in very critical ways. And to successfully operate a nonprofit, you really have to have a good understanding of what's required and a, really a philosophy of adhering to best practices. That's what we're going to talk about for the remainder of our time. So unique attributes of a nonprofit. What's the what's different part? Well, the term nonprofit is all about structure and purpose, not necessarily the bottom line. You know, when we go back over the history of this business, we find that one of the things that's been consistent over the years is that people tend to use certain terms interchangeably. They're going to use the word nonprofit, 501c3 charity, foundation. They're going to use those interchangeably as if they're all meaning the same thing. From a technical standpoint, if you live on our side of the compliance world, you come to understand that they are not the same thing. And so when we talk about nonprofit, actually, that's not about the bottom line. It's not about zeroing out. That's a myth that we hear from time to time from people who haven't done this before. They somehow heard somewhere that if you raise $100,000 in 2018, you have to have spent every bit of it by December 31, 2018. Well, newsflash, that's going to cause a really big problem on January 1, 2019. So no, you don't have to zero out. An organization can and should make a little bit more money than it's spending. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a problem with sustainability. So nonprofit is not about bottom line. It's about how you're structured, what your purpose is and how you're conducting yourself. Another unique attribute of a nonprofit is that nonprofits have no owners. There is no mechanism for ownership. You know, if you're talking about a for-profit corporation, they have stock. You know, if it's a if it's a publicly traded organization, I think everybody understands that. You own shares of stock in Coca-Cola or General Electric or IBM. But even privately held corporations have have stock that the owners own. That's how you own a corporation. With an LLC or a partnership, maybe it's a little bit different. They have percentage split ownership based on a partnership agreement. Well, with a nonprofit, there is nothing to designate ownership. The people who are governing the organization are really considered stewards, not owners. And that leads us into our next point here. Nonprofits are governed by a board of directors. Now, it is true that this can also be the case with some for-profits, but not always. It's virtually always true with a nonprofit that the governing body is a board of directors. Now, in your case, it may be called something different. I served on the board of a private school for several years, and we were called trustees. 
we've seen church organizations or religious organizations that may refer to their governing body as elders or some other type of religious title. It's all the same thing. It's still a board of directors. And a board of directors is a group of people who share responsibility for governing the affairs of the nonprofit. This is the group of people who are responsible for mission, for oversight, for accountability. They're the ones that approve budgets. Now they're not management. Management is the day to day, but management is accountable to the board. The board is the one that is setting the course and overseeing the operation. Another unique attribute of a nonprofit is that they exist for a charitable or other non-commercial purpose. Now, the majority of nonprofit organizations in America are charitable. They're set up for the purpose of providing charitable benefit under 501c3. And purposes can range from religious to scientific research, to educational, literary. There's quite a number of these, animal welfare, children's welfare. There's also other types of nonprofits that may be fraternal in nature or their business association related like chambers of commerce or social clubs. Chambers of commerce, for example, comes under a category called 501c6. Social clubs or fraternities, for example, come under 501c7. So there are types of nonprofits that are not charitable, but they don't have a commercial purpose. So now that we've taken a look at an overview of what a nonprofit is, let's take a look at the technical steps of actually getting a nonprofit up and running. Well, there's four primary steps to doing this. The first is organization, then incorporation, then 501c3 status, and finally, we'll round out our conversation with charitable solicitation registration. So let's take a look at these one at a time. The first one is organization. I will tell you quite honestly that this is probably the most underappreciated step, and it involves a number of things. The first one is research. Uh, so what are we talking about? What are we researching? Well, first is need. What is the need or problem that your organization is designed to solve? I think if you're already at the stage of starting a nonprofit, you probably have answered this one already. Feasibility may be another story. Researching feasibility or evaluating feasibility can your idea work? Can your solution actually accomplish what it's designed to do? Have you thought through the resources necessary to make that happen? That could be financial resources, that could be people resources, that could even be physical location or facility resources. Another thing you need to research and evaluate is sustainability. Can you establish a sufficient income stream to keep this going, either through donations or grants or program revenue or some other source of revenue, sales of product and services, have you evaluated sustainability? So another part of organization is planning, a three-year plan of action. This is also another very underappreciated discipline, and it's one thing that it, we really encourage our clients to undertake. And a three-year plan helps you visualize long-term, not just in the immediate 90 days. I think a lot of times, especially for people that's never started a business or started a nonprofit, there's a tendency to think very near term and, and have your vision very short in front of you when really it kind of opens up your world to think in a bigger, uh, bigger time window. And as far as a three-year plan, it's really helpful when applying for 501c3 status to have gone through this effort. And it, it doesn't have to be formal. I mean, we're not talking about putting together a bound package that is in micro detail of this three-year plan. We'll, we'll get to that. Part of the process kind of includes that. The initial step of the three-year plan of action is really just a thorough thinking through of how you see this program operating, how it's going to be funded, all of those sorts of things. I've seen well, well thought out plans that were sketched out on one sheet of legal paper. So there's no formal way it has to be done, but beginning this process by thinking that through is a really critical step. What's another step in organization? Well, governance. We talked about your board of directors. At this point, you want to begin recruiting your initial board members. Now, we could be talking about three, five, or seven qualified people. We tend to think in terms of odd numbers. That's just kind of a, a quirk within the nonprofit community that a best practice is considered an odd number of board members. It doesn't mean that you can't have an even number. Uh, I've served on boards with both. There's not 
any reason you have to strive for that. I think it just goes to the idea that in a board vote, uh, you can't have a tie if it's an odd number. Well, that's true as long as everybody shows up. So, but anyway, thinking in terms of something manageable, three people, five people, seven people, the key here is getting qualified people and choosing wisely for this initial board. And what do we mean by qualified or choosing wisely? Well, you need people who are on board with your mission and you need people who are gonna be willing to contribute time, talent, and treasure. What we call the three T's. They need to be able to contribute those three things to help advance the mission of this organization. You do not, hear me out on this, you do not want placeholders. You do not want people that are simply friends of yours who are doing you a favor by filling a slot on a piece of paper and not actually contributing the three T's to your organization. Another thing to look at for the majority of you listening to this presentation today, you're going to be setting up a public charity 501c3. And if that's the case, you're gonna to need to have a majority of your board unrelated to each other by blood, marriage, or outside business ownership. All right, what else? Get our slide to advance here. So that's step number one, that's organization. Let's talk about step number two, which is incorporation, the creation of a legal entity at the state level. This is where it gets real. At this point, you are creating a legal entity that exists apart from the people forming it. It exists apart from you. It is the core entity that everything else we're gonna be doing is attached to. Now, a key point here is you can only incorporate in one state. Now, you can have multi-state operations, but you cannot incorporate but in one single place. You may be a California corporation that's also doing work in Arizona, but you can't be incorporated in two places at once. Another question that we get oftentimes is, do I have to be a corporation? Well, you don't have to be, but you probably will be. Your choices are severely limited anyway. 95 plus percent of nonprofits are nonprofit corporations. There are a select few that can be set up as a trust or an unincorporated, an unincorporated association. Ones that are set up as trusts usually know in advance that's what they need to be for a very specific reason. If you are wondering whether you should be, the answer is probably no, you shouldn't be. Um, if you're going into this with a trust set up, you probably know it already. Unincorporated associations are possible but not recommended because it, it, it really creates a liability situation potentially for the people involved. 95 plus percent, as I said, of nonprofits are gonna be corporate structures. Now these are not C-Corps. They're not S-Corps, those are types of for-profit organizations. It's not an LLC, so you don't wanna be looking at this. We, we've had clients come to us that already went and formed an LLC, and they came to us and said, hey, I formed this LLC, now I wanna make it a nonprofit. Well, that doesn't work, and partnerships don't work in this regard either. Another question that we get all the time is, so where should we incorporate? Well, almost all the time, it's best to incorporate in your state of operations. There's virtually no exception to this. And a question that we frequently get is, what about Delaware? Well, it's just simply not advantageous for nonprofits to incorporate in Delaware unless you're located there. That's a myth that's really associated with for-profits. Um, it's a myth for nonprofits that's associated with for-profits. There is advantage to for-profits to incorporate in Delaware. A lot of that has to do with privacy rules and anti-transparency rules. It's just simpler to operate a corporation that is based in Delaware from a legal standpoint. That's not true for nonprofits. Those transparency rules don't apply. The IRS requires complete visibility to everything that's going on. So, and besides that, incorporating in Delaware doesn't relieve you of any home state compliance requirements. So. A key point here that to watch out for companies that promote Delaware incorporation for nonprofits. They're probably doing it because it's easier for them, not for you. So step number three, we've got the corporate entity established. And as we said, everything revolves around that. The next part of this process, step number three is IRS 501c3 status. And IRS 501c3 status simply means that the IRS has deemed your nonprofit corporation to be exempt from federal income tax specifically as a public charity or a private foundation or private operating foundation. Again, this is the situation where people tend to use terms like nonprofit and 501c3 interchangeably, and they're not. 
So 501c3 status, that is a tax status attached to your nonprofit corporation. So most of you listening today are going to be set up as a public charity. And one thing I do want to point out as we continue forward in this presentation, on your dashboard, you will see a section on there for questions. Feel free, and I should have mentioned this earlier on, but feel free to enter in any questions, type those out. I know that our support team is going to be answering a lot of these on the fly, and we're going to pull out several to talk about here at the end and address for everybody's benefit. All right, back to 501c3 status. Well, 501c3 status is granted to your organization after a thorough, thorough review, I'll get it out here, a thorough review of IRS Form 1023. So what is that? Well, from a practical standpoint, you really should think of the Form 1023 as the equivalent of a business plan. You know, we talked about that three-year plan. This is really where that comes into play by providing the information needed to get into the detail that the IRS is going to require on this. And IRS is looking for detail. They're looking for specifics, not generalities on Form 1023. The Form 1023 gives the IRS really a deep and thorough look into the organization's structure, its, uh, its proposed programs, operations, governance, income and expense activity. There's a lot that goes into this. And from this slide, I think you can get a feel for that. Filing packages for a Form 1023 typically range from 40 to 100 plus pages. And we're talking about dozens of yes, no, explain type questions. We're talking about listing of board members and relationships between them. Uh, questions involving conflict of interest. This is one of the key areas that the IRS focuses on is conflict of interest. There are subschedules to the Form 1023 that have even more questions depending on your particular program or activities that you're doing. And when we talk about our clients, more of our clients are ranging, are, are on the 100 page version of that 40 to 100 range. Not many come in at that lower level. Another thing that's included with the Form 1023 is a three year budget. And if you've been around for a little while, they're gonna want prior year financial information. What they're looking for is they want to see where you're getting your money and how you're spending your money. What are the sources? You're getting it from donations, fundraisers, product and service sales, what are your expense categories? What are your prior year activity details if you have any? So this is a well thought out, and again, if we're talking about an organization that hasn't done anything yet, we're talking about a well thought out pro forma over the next three years. For organizations that have actually kind of gotten, gotten started a little bit, it could be a mix of the two. Also included with Form 1023 is a written narrative of program and purpose, and this is where your story is told. If you've ever been a part of a journalism class or anything involving that, at some point you probably heard the phrase who, what, when, where, how, and why. That is exactly what the narrative is in a Form 1023. We need to make the case to the IRS that both your purpose and your programs satisfy a qualifying exempt purpose. We talked about what some of those predefined categories are, well, this is really where Foundation Group excels in knowing exactly how to best position a client and their organization and putting together this written narrative that explains in detail what the mission of the organization is, what the need is, the details of the program, who's doing it, when it's being done, how it's being done, where it's being done, and exactly how not only does this qualify under 501c3, but how does it go about accomplishing the need or solving the need and accomplishing the mission. So what is the IRS looking for on Form 1023? Well, we've kind of we've kind of said this. They're looking for a qualifying purpose. So the predefined categories of religious, educational, charitable, does your nonprofit, does the Form 1023 that you're applying under, does it adequately prove that what you're going to be doing satisfies a pre-existing IRS definition of charitable or other tax exempt category? The IRS is also looking for qualifying program. Are the programs obviously connected to the stated purpose, for one thing? Do those programs and your execution of them directly accomplish that charitable purpose? And then finally, really, are there conflicts of interest? Now, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little while, but conflict of interest, uh, we keyed on it just a second ago, it's a huge area that the IRS looks like, uh, looks at, rather. And what they're looking for is 
not necessarily just the existence of conflict of interest, but possible private benefit to insiders. We're going to get into the definition of that in a few minutes. IRS is also looking for proper organizational structure. Is the organization properly incorporated at the state level? Does it have a qualifying governance structure? And we're talking about board of directors here. Is there sufficient public support? This comes into play if you're a public charity. And again, most of our clients are our public charities. Most of you listening to this are proposing public charities. And to kind of give you a feel for the difference, a public charity operationally is one that has an operating program impacting the community in some way. And that's contrasted with a 501c3 that's set up as a private foundation that primarily is an organization that people have given into as a pool of resource money to fund the work of public charities. Most of you looking to set a program loose into a community, you're looking at a public charity. And that can be anything from an enterprise level organization like the Red Cross to a community food bank. So for an organization like that, the IRS is wanting to see if enough of your donor base is coming from a small base of do or small donations from a broader base of donors as opposed to being primarily funded by a family or a close group. So the results, what are you looking for as a result of the Form 1023 process? Well, you are looking for a letter of determination. And the letter of determination states that the IRS has reviewed your application and found that you qualify to be tax exempt. That's what you want. And that's going to be under 501c3 or if you're one of those other non-charitable, non-commercial types, 501c4 or something else. The letter of determination is going to include the effective date of the 501c3 status. A pretty cool part of that is it's probably going to be backdated to your date of incorporation. That's true so long as you began the 501c3 application process within 27 months of being incorporated, and most people do. And if that's the case, the IRS almost always backdates that to the date of incorporation so that all of the activity that happens between the date of incorporation and being granted 501c3 status is captured retroactively there. And we've worked with more than 17,000 organizations to get their letter of determination, and we are just thrilled and happy and proud to say that we've done that with a 100% approval rate. So how long does it take? Everybody wants to know. In fact, one of our top 20 pages on our website when people are searching through our FAQs is how long does it take to get 501c3 status? Believe it or not, of the hundreds of pages on our website, that's in the top 20 trafficked. So everybody wants to know that. Well, it can vary pretty wildly and a lot of it depends on the IRS backlog. We've seen over the years, the IRS backlog range anywhere from 90 days to a year and a half. If you go back into the days of 2012, 2013, it was a nightmare. It was in that year and a half range. It was taking a year and a half for the IRS to even look at applications that had been sent in. Right now, we're seeing a current backlog of about three to six months. What else can cause timeline changes? Well, the complexity of your programs. The more complicated the program plan, um, honestly, the longer it can take for the IRS to sort through all of it. One of the things I would tell you, though, is beware of the temptation to downplay details, downplay details for fear of extending the review. Don't ever do that. You always need to lay out programs exactly as they will function. And that's something that we always do with our clients. Well, one of the biggest factors in the IRS approval timeline is the quality of the application. In fact, once you've gotten over the hurdle of being having a purpose that qualifies, this is probably the single most important factor. And it, one of the things that we put the most effort into, we work with clients to make sure that their program is fully compliant. And once we do that, we take and translate that into a solid application that can hopefully result in a pre-screen approval. What a lot of people don't know is that applications for 501c3, the form 1023, when they get sent into the IRS, they all go through a pre-screening process or a triage. Well, most end up getting passed through to a reviewer for more in-depth review. Well, we're fortunate that 80 to 90% of our applications fall into the pre-screen approval category. And that's because we know how to put these together and represent you in a way that makes you look like exactly the way the IRS wants to see you. So it's not necessarily special treatment, it's just knowing how to get this done the right way. 
So that's 501c3. That's your tax status. That's what you're going into this process. At least if you don't have all the information you need, you knew that before you got started, I got to get a 501c3. Well, what you may not know is that's not the end of it. Charitable solicitation registration, we got to circle back around to that because you need to raise money and it takes permission to do that. 501c3 status is not enough to get you there. You're going to need to register with states in order to fundraise in them. Now, charitable solicitation registration, it is something that is administered at the state level. It's not federal. And charities must register prior to soliciting donations from the public. And what this is, is the states are requiring you to be registered or licensed to be able to, in essence, conduct your activity. And the reason we say that is, is because the definition of solicitation has changed a lot over the years. In prior times, when enforcement was not as strict as it is now, solicitation was what you might think it is, and that's asking people for money. But now the majority of states are defining solicitation as any activity that's gen that generates revenue for your nonprofit. So what are we talking about? We're talking about donations, sales of goods or services, membership dues, participation fees. Honestly, state level compliance is in many ways much more strict and definitely much more immediate. And the penalties for noncompliance sadly can be swift and very expensive. We had a situation a number of years ago, this was probably about three or four years ago, I was walking through my uh, family room one evening and the late news was on and I just happened to glance up and notice that the logo of one of our new clients was uh, was superimposed on the Chiron graphics above the uh, above the anchor's shoulder and I thought hey that's our client we just we just picked those guys up so I unmuted the sound and expected this to be a great highlight piece for this veterans charity well turns out it was a hit piece this organization had approached us because they knew they were not compliant with registering to solicit, but they had a big fundraiser coming up and they were expecting to raise maybe even seven figures with this activity. Well, somebody checked with the state, found they weren't registered to solicit, reported them to the state and the state had fined them $25,000 for five separate, it was five separate penalties of $5,000 each for five separate violations. So what resulted was a ton of embarrassment. Now, fortunately, we were able to work with that client and help them get those penalties abated because the state was really more concerned about seeing the organization get everything set up the way it needed to be. So they ended up abating those penalties. Well, that's not always the case. There are states that will not abate penalties and there are states that are much more punitive in their approach. Fortunately, our home state of Tennessee was not for that client. But I'll tell you what didn't happen either. And that was once they got their act together and got things compliant, the TV station didn't come back and give a happy ending story. So it caused a lot of problems for that organization to not be compliant. So where do you need to register? Well, depending on fundraising activities, your nonprofit may have to register in multiple states. 41 states and the District of Columbia have some form of registration requirement. Now, a handful of those are very purpose targeted. In the state of Texas, it's very narrowly focused on police organizations and some veterans groups. Arizona is almost exclusively some veterans groups, but virtually all states have some type of registration requirement. What's really critical is that it's important to trust somebody who knows how to vet multi-state liabilities because it's not, it's often not as it appears. There's an obvious danger in under-registration because you don't want to be penalized. But there's also unnecessary expense and hassle with being over-registered in states that you may think you need to be registered in, but you're not interpreting the regulations correctly. So that's one of the areas that we really work with clients to make sure that they're not that they're doing every bit as much as they need to do, but not too much. So where do you not have registration liability? Well, there are a handful of states here that have no charities division essentially in that state and so they don't have any registration requirements. So if you just happen to be in, what do we see here, Vermont, Delaware, Indiana, Iowa, um, South Dakota, Montana, some of these others, if you are based in those states, you're not going to have to register in those states. So that's good. But maybe you're an Idaho organization that's not required to register in Idaho, but you're asking people in California for money you probably will have a registration requirement in California. 
So now that we've talked about the four steps, we've talked about organization, incorporation, 501c3 status, and we've talked about charitable solicitations. I wanna kind of shift gears, kind of shake the cobwebs out. Let's kind of shift gears from the technical and let's talk about the, the practical. I wanna look at the soft skills and the important attributes that really define success for a nonprofit. And we're gonna do that by taking a look at do's and don'ts. I think that's one of the best ways that we could approach this conversation. So let's start out with a negative and end with a positive. So what are some of the don'ts? Or we call this section, what to avoid? Well, the first thing that you want to avoid is private benefit or what the IRS calls inurement. We want to make sure that any conflict of interest doesn't result in unfair benefit to individuals. And that's really what inurement is defined as. Now, it is not at all uncommon to have conflict of interest within an organization. In fact, it's not always bad to have conflict of interest within an organization. Let me put it this way. If you've got someone on your board of directors who's also going to be a paid employee, you've got conflict of interest. That's just a natural thing that's gonna exist in that situation. It doesn't mean it's bad. In fact, it is extraordinarily common. It's not always good either, let me make sure I say that, but it is extraordinarily common for in a startup situation, especially in the first three to five years, that you have one or more board members who may also be being paid as employees. That's not the end of the world. What we have to make sure though, is that that conflict of interest does not result in unfair benefit. What is their unfair benefit? Well, maybe it's excess compensation. Maybe it is the person who's on the board, but also working there voting on their own pay. Well, they can't do that. It's important to understand that to avoid inurement, you have to put arm's length processes in place. And we spend a lot of time talking to clients about conflict of interest. When we come to learn what it is that you're going to be doing and how it's going to be structured, that's one of the things that we key in on the most quickly and the most obviously is identifying areas of conflict of interest within your organization and helping you make sure that you do have arm's length procedures in place so that the IRS doesn't have concern with it because that is a huge area of concern for them. So what else? Avoid commercially equivalent activity. Now, we said before under our section or our slide that talks about the similarities of for-profits and non-profits that both can sell goods or services and that is absolutely the truth. But for a nonprofit, you got to make sure that what you're selling, that the activity itself or of selling goods and services directly accomplishes a charitable purpose. If you if you can't do that or somehow it's too far removed, the accomplishment of mission is too far removed from the actual sales activity, well, at best, you could be getting into what's called unrelated business income, which it can be taxable, a, a taxable situation, and it's complicated to deal with. At worst, if you've got too much of it coming in, it's not just complicating, it's disqualifying. So watch out for, com for commercial equivalent activity. Another thing to look out for is what we call founder syndrome. It is real and it is crippling. So what is founder syndrome? Well, it is this temptation to maintain an iron-fisted grip on the organization and its operations. And what usually comes out of that is micromanagement, and nobody likes to be micromanaged. And the further net result of that is it tends to prevent engagement with those who can really help the organization achieve its goals. You know, it, it Frankly, it stifles growth and limits potential. So watch for the death grip. Also, what to avoid, non-compliance. This, uh, honestly, this is one of the most important don'ts. Non-compliance with state and federal requirements really puts you, it puts you on the fast track to losing what you started. Penalties for non-compliance, at a minimum, you're talking about embarrassment and loss of reputation. This is what happened to the veterans charity I was talking about. That little snafu probably cost them a year's worth of fundraising success. It can involve expensive penalties. Again, the veterans charity, we were fortunate to get them out of it. That's not always going to be the case. A new development that just happened very, very recently, California's Division of Charities just recently announced a new penalty system that for certain penalties that they assess against charities, they're going to prohibit those penalties being paid on an organizational check. So what does that mean? They're expecting those penalties to be paid by individual board members or somebody, some person or persons 
who are responsible to make sure that stuff happened. Now, why are they doing that? Well, they're trying to make lack of compliance painful to an individual so that that will increase compliance. Now, what we know here is most non-compliance is based on ignorance, not on willful intent. So I'm not sure that what California is trying to accomplish there will actually be accomplished, but this is their new policy anyway. Ultimately, in its worst case scenario, non-compliance can cost you your organization's existence. I take you back to the day where 100,000 plus organizations lost their status. So let's get to the happy stuff, the do's or best practices. What are some things that are going to be beneficial for you to do? Well, number one, always be about your charitable purpose. I mean, your mission and your purpose, that's the rudder of your ship. You're going to want to measure, once you get going, if you've got new ideas or new initiatives that you want to do or a program expansion, always measure that back to the mission. What is our mission statement? What is our purpose? Is this new thing consistent with that? Is it just an extension of what we're doing in natural growth or are we charting new territory? It's okay to chart new territory. That's not bad, but it's not automatic that you can do that. So watch out for mission creep. Another thing that's a best practice, always strive for transparency of operations. Number one, it's legally required. You don't have a choice. You're going to have to report annually to the IRS and probably your state about your activities. And plus, and this is really key, transparency helps foster trust with the public. You need that trust. Always strive for transparency of finances. Again, this is something that's legally required. And again, it fosters the trust that you need. And if there's anything you want from your donors or potential donors, it's their trust and confidence. What's another best practice? Well, we recommend that you do communicate regularly with your community or donor base. Look, it's easy to be forgotten. There are lots and lots of organizations doing good work who are all competing for your charitable donations. Think about the people that reach out to you for you to donate to them. There's a ton of them. You can't help everybody. So you need to be visible. You need to be in front of people and com be compelling in what it is that you're trying to do and what you're trying to communicate. Put out a newsletter, build an active social media community, let your stakeholders and your donor base share in what you're accomplishing, keep them informed. And if you're talking about a donor, never, ever, ever fail to thank a donor. What's another best practice? Well, always maintain best practice governance. And this involves fully engaging with your board. Your board is not a necessary evil. They really are the backbone of your organization. And it's key to meet with them regularly. And this is especially true in the early days. You need to establish up front a regular rhythm of meeting with your board. Early on, this may be monthly. And as the organization matures, maybe you can back off to once a quarter, maybe. But avoid the temptation to not meet regularly. And if you're talking about something that you know our board meets one meets meets annually once a year that's not enough there's no way you can keep your board informed of what they need to know by doing it annually lack of board engagement is an early warning sign of of impending trouble so make sure that your board is engaged what else well i think this speaks for itself it's a core principle we've come back to over and over in this presentation maintain full compliance with state and federal regulations you need to know what the legal limits on your program and operations are for one. You need to understand what you're allowed to do and what you can't do under the type of organizational approval that you have. Also, make sure that all of your, or your records are current and accurate. We're talking about corporate records, bookkeeping, meeting minutes. We're also talking about making sure that you stay current with keeping everything filed that needs to be filed. Maintain from day one, make it a priority to maintain a solid compliance track record for state and federal reporting requirements. This includes Form 990, your corporate annual report, state charity registrations and renewals. This is stuff that we do. So get help if you don't know this stuff. We would love to be a resource that you can depend on. Our bread and butter is helping nonprofits stay compliant through the life cycle of their organization, not just helping them get started. So get help if you need it. I want to talk to you now about what we call our Sure Start program. We are so proud of this, and we call this the complete consulting base, nothing left to, to chance solution for startup nonprofits. And this is how Foundation Group works with startups to address everything that we've talked about. And one of our core guiding principles is to recommend to our clients no more but no less 
than exactly what they need in order to succeed. And Sure Start is built around that concept. And it's going to include some of the obvious stuff. We're going to do everything we talked about on the procedural side, nonprofit incorporation, 501c3 status, state charity registration. But it's not just that. Those are the technical steps. We're also going to represent your case before the IRS. We're going to talk to them and correspond for you if they have any questions. We're going to guarantee your IRS approval. If we're working with you, you're going to get it and that's guaranteed. So what else are we doing through our Sure Start program? Well, we're taking care of the first year's IRS Form 990. Now this is the equivalent of the organization's corporate tax return and it's due every year. Well, we're gonna do the first one of those under SureStart. We're also gonna give you a solid year of appointment access to our team of experts and you know, on an ongoing basis also on our message board, which, which results a lot of times in a more immediate response, but for, for more detailed discussions that you want on issues relevant to your nonprofit compliance, we can do that through appointment. So finally, let me wrap this up by just talking a little bit about Foundation Group. Why should you trust us to be your resource for all of this work? Well, for 23 years, this has been exclusively what we do. We were in fact the first specialty company in America to offer nonprofit compliance services to a far-flung nonprofit nationwide clientele. Just among our nonprofit formation consultants, not our entire team, it would be a lot more than this. We've got over 130 years of combined experience just among our formation specialist team, our exemption specialists. There just isn't many situations or scenarios at all that we haven't dealt with. We've got people on our team that have been with us for over a decade and virtually all of our team have worked with thousands of organizations in some of the most complex situations you can imagine. Overall, we've worked with, I think we mentioned this before, 17,000 or so startups, more than 20,000 organizations overall. And while this slide may not represent an actual picture or a picture of our actual clients, it could be. Our goal is to give our clients a huge head start and advantage towards success. Guarantee, I'll wrap up talking about that. We stand behind what we do. We've got a money back guarantee for our Sure Start program that if the IRS were to fail to grant status, we would refund the Sure Start fee you paid to us, as well as the IRS fee that you pay to have your application reviewed. In 23 years, we've never had to make good on that refund. So that's about as strong a guarantee as I can possibly give you. Finally, why Foundation Group? And this is the one that means the most to me. We genuinely care about your success. We could have chosen a legal Zoom self-help type document prep model. We didn't do that. We also could choose to outsource all of our work to an unsupervised group of freelancers like some other companies do. It'd be a lot cheaper for us to do that. We chose instead to invest in an inside team of experts who really care about charity. The vast majority of our staff are involved in charities of their own, and they really do have a mission to see you succeed in what you do. And help you turn your vision into reality and we hope that you'll allow us to be a part of that. So thank you so much for your attentiveness. I hope this has been valuable to you. We've had questions coming in during the course of our interaction today and I know the team's been working hard to get some of those answered but they've passed a few of those along to me to see if we can answer these uh, for the benefit of everybody. So let's go through go through some of these here. So here's one. Do people on the board of directors have a personal liability from the operation of the nonprofit? Well, possibly. It's not, it's not too extreme. You know, if you get in a situation where there's gross negligence, let's say that you don't have, let's say you're a children's organization and you're not doing background checks on your childcare workers and something happens to one of the kids. Well, yeah, you got liability there. I mean, there's a whole due diligence thing that comes into play with regard to uh, gross negligence. But in general, liability is pretty limited. And that's also one of the benefits of having corporate status is it provides a layer of liability protection from those that are involved. I do recommend, however, that you check out directors and officers insurance or DNO insurance as a liability protection for your board members. It tends to be very inexpensive insurance and it's just another layer of protection. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, what is the difference, if any, between a private foundation and a charitable foundation? Well, in answer to that, it really would be a private foundation versus a public charity. I think we covered that a little bit before. 
from a standpoint of operation, a charity tends to be the feet on the street action happening, um, like a Red Cross or a food bank, whereas a private foundation tends to be a resource of finances to help fund that activity. So that's that's kind of the operational definition there. Uh, the next question, can you register uh, for this before getting the letter of determination? I think what the what the person asking this question is talking about is charitable state charitable solicitation registration. Can you do that before you get your IRS determination letter? In a handful of states, the answer is yes. In the vast majority of states, the answer is no on that. And that's something that we can help people vet. Um, what else? Um, can you give an example of conflict of interest? Well, one of the ones we mentioned before was the board member who's also going to be a paid employee. Another potential conflict of interest might be you've got a board member who's got an outside business and that outside business is potentially going to conduct commerce with the charity. I had a situation like this on the school board that I served on where one of our board members owned a commercial, he was a commercial contractor, owned a construction company, and he was one of the bidders, his company was one of the bidders for a new concessions facility we were building at the football field. Well, when it came time to evaluate those bids, we had to let Steve recuse himself and not even being the, be in the room when we discussed who we were actually going to hire as the vendor. That way that provided a true arm's length situation. As it turned out, uh, our board member got the job, not because we knew him, but because he was actually the low bid. And we followed true best practice and arm's length procedures in order to make that decision. So what else? If I travel around to different states, do I need to register in multiple states in advance? Again, that question depends, and that seems to be the answer to most questions asked at Foundation Group is it depends. In this case, more often than not, the answer is going to be yes. You would need to register with that state prior to having fundraising activities or some other type of activity in that state. Again, the answer can sometimes be no, and it, it's just critically important to have a partner like Foundation Group to help you vet that. And let's see, um, finally, do nonprofit members have to be on the board? Um, this is kind of a too long of a, of a, of a potential answer, but I'll, I'll kind of touch on it briefly. Members that have voting power, some organizations, some churches, some private schools, some other type of organizations, they have a membership base that have a right to uh, nominate and vote on board members. In that situation, they're typically not on the board, they're responsible for establishing the board. So hopefully that helps with that, that answer. So again, our contact information is on the screen here. We hope to hear from you. We would love to be your resource for both formation with our Sure Start program, with any of your compliance needs from Form 990 to bookkeeping to charitable solicitation to registration. We love what we do and we would love to work for you. We hope this has been extremely helpful for you. It's been a lot of fun for us. And we look forward to touching base with you either by phone or communication uh, as you look to explore setting up your nonprofit. So thanks for attending and we hope everybody has a great day.